We're going to turn to the word of the Lord this morning. If you have your Bible, uh, we are jumping into a, a new series this morning, and um, we've simply entitled it The Beginning, because that's where we're going. We're going to the book of Genesis. If you have your Bible and you open it up, uh, wherever you open it up, just go all the way left, okay? All the way left, you'll end up in the book of Genesis. And uh, I'm excited for this series because uh, of the importance of this book. It is foundational for us as believers. I said it last week, but I think it bears repeating that next to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is not a more controversial subject than what is spoken of in uh, the first chapter, especially of Genesis. And in my thinking, you know, the, the resurrection tops the list because it is Jesus' resurrection that verifies all of the claims that he made. But understand this, if the resurrection is true, then Genesis chapter one, verse one is also true. Because Jesus came and he claimed to be the son of God. And, and again, he proved that to be true when he conquered death in the grave. And, and one of the things that, that Jesus declared was that the book of Genesis is true. You know, because of the resurrection, I can simply say this, Jesus said it, therefore I believe it, right? Whenever Jesus declares to be truth, I accept his truth. And, and, and here's why it's important, because again, he declared the book of Genesis to be true. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is having a discussion about divorce, and he asks this question. He says, have you not read, in the book of Genesis, he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? right? He, he's making reference to Genesis chapter 1 as the foundation for his teaching. Now, before we look at our text for today, it's going to be just a few verses of scripture this morning, but I have to preference our, our time today by saying we could be in the book of Genesis for a while, okay? It's going to be at least a year, so be ready, all right? Because we're going to go verse by verse, we're going to go chapter by chapter. Now, you might ask, Pastor, why are we going to spend so much time in the Old Testament? Why study the Old Testament? After all, if, if the revelation of God is complete in Jesus, why would we look back at something that is maybe less complete? Why study the Old Testament or the Old Covenant now that we have the New Covenant, right? And I, I think what you'll find is there are, are many pastors that avoid the Old Testament because there are some difficult passages there. We're not going to avoid those passages in Genesis. But I also believe this. You can't fully understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. Here's why. Out of the 260 chapters that make up the New Testament, 229 of them contain not one, but at least two citations or references to the Old Testament. Almost one-third of the New Testament is quotes or, or allusions to the Old Testament passages. In, in fact, there's only 12 chapters, 12 chapters in the entire New Testament that don't contain a specific reference to the Old Testament. And, and so the real question is not why should we study the Old Testament. The real question is how could we not, right? How could we not? How would we really know what the writers of the New Testament are referring to if we don't spend time studying the Old Testament? Now, another reason that we should study the Old Testament is the fact that there are revelations of God in the Old Testament that cannot be found in the New Testament. And so we actually learn more about our Savior, Jesus Christ, by studying the Old Testament. And that's why we're here, amen? To, to know him, to know him more. If you have your note sheet, I encourage you to pull it out and follow along with us. Just a couple of words of encouragement before we jump into the text. Uh, because I've spoken to quite a few of you recently and was talking about my excitement getting into the book of Genesis, and you say, Pastor, I just really want to know the Word of God more. A number of people, I just want to dig into it. I want, to, I want to understand it more. Well, Genesis is a good place to start. And if that's your desire, then I would encourage you, pick up a paperback Bible, okay? Now, I know you have a phone on your app. You have multiple phones on your app. They'll read the Bible to you. They'll even play music behind it while it's reading it to you, right? But I, I want to tell you this. You will absorb the word of God. You will interact with it that much better by having a paper copy that you can open up and write in. I, I have a number of Bibles I've picked up through the years. I've got little notes here and there. Some of them are in good shape. Some of them aren't. Some of them are starting to fall apart a little bit. That's okay because Charles Haddon Spurgeon used to say, a Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't, right? So pick up a Bible, be a student of the word. If you're wondering which Bible to use, I generally go through the ESV. I would recommend the ESV journaling Bible. We actually got a crazy good deal. I got a crazy good deal on some Bibles. They're, they're actually out at the cafe. I think we have like five or six left. They are buffalo hide, so if you're vegan, it's not gonna work for you, I'm sorry. 
If you're over 40, they're small print. It's probably not going to work for you. Okay, we'll get some large print next week, uh, but we got a good deal on those. We'll pass it on to you. You can get one at the cafe. But regardless, probably many of you have a couple Bibles at home. I want to encourage you. Let's bring them to church together. Amen? And let's open it to the Word of God uh, together as we go through the book of Genesis. Now, why Genesis? Again, I I believe you won't truly understand anything else in the Bible until you understand Genesis. Genesis is what is known as the book of beginnings. It gives us the beginning of the universe, the beginning of the atmosphere and the biosphere, uh, the beginning of man and animals and evil and marriage, family, work, the covenants. Genesis reports on the first murder. Genesis tells us why we have so many diverse languages, the Tower of Babel, right? It gives us the origin of the nations that resulted from that. It exposes the beginning of sin. It tells us sin's results in the world. It gives us the nature of marriage, of manhood, of womanhood, things we need to discuss, especially in this day and age. It displays the the judgment of God. There is the banishment from the garden. There's the the flood, the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are all types of the final judgment to come. There's 165 passages from Genesis that are quoted in the New Testament. Christ himself quoted Genesis at least six times. Now, if you reject the historicity of Genesis, I gotta say, you'll have to throw away the historicity of the entire Bible and the integrity of Jesus Christ. And it's precisely because it's so foundational that it's quoted so much in the rest of Scripture. Genesis covers a time period of about 2,500 years of human history. From, From the fall of man until the death of Joseph. Now, there's a number of ways that you could break up this book or or outline this book. One of my favorite ways is by uh, uh, evangelist G. Campbell Morgan. He was a British evangelist and preacher, late 1800s, early 1900s. And he divided Genesis into these three main divisions. You can write these down. The the first one is generation. We're gonna see that in Genesis chapter one and two. The second is degeneration, Genesis three through 11. And finally, Genesis 12 through 50, is regeneration, all right? So are you ready for Genesis? That was a week. Are you ready for Genesis? Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, in other words, you can't go back any further than this. This is as far back as it's possible for us to go. But when that question comes up, a lot of people ask, well, when was that? When, when was the beginning? Now, most evangelical Christians hold to a young earth view. They will say the earth is no more than 10,000 years old. There are some that will say it's 6,000 years old because they look at the genealogies, especially in the book of Genesis, and, and they see them as closed genealogies, meaning they're complete genealogies. And if you look at those genealogies and you extrapolate the ages and the generations, you come up with a number somewhere between six to 10,000 years old. Now, there are others, believers, who would disagree with that and say, well, the beginning of the universe is anywhere from 2 billion to 20 billion years old. Now, I don't really agree with that position, but at the same time, I don't want to take time to get into all that because I think there's good arguments in both camps. And if you want to do some studying on that, you're on your own, okay? Because when I read these arguments so often, what I think of is what God says to Job. You remember the book of Job after Job and his friends tell God all that they need to say? Here's God's response to them. He says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? <laughs> tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? You see, the problem with the different views, young earth, old earth, is that in the end we can only speculate. I don't know when exactly the beginning was, but I know without a doubt that God was there. In the beginning, God. Here's what I find so interesting. The Bible makes no attempt to argue the existence of God. Instead, Scripture assumes his existence. The first sentence of Scripture tells us that there is a creator of the universe. And if there is a creator, that means, among other things, that there is meaning to our existence. If there's no creator, then it stands to reason that there's no ultimate purpose to to our existence. Now, some will say, well, mankind just just made up God. Mankind wanted to have meaning, and so they had this desire for meaning, and so they made up God. And the truth is this. We are the one species that cannot live without meaning. It's almost like somebody created us that way. And, And so the atheist will argue that God does not exist. You guys, you made him up. But if God does not exist, then the atheist has made something up. He has made up meaning. 
Because if God does not exist, the atheist has created meaning that does not exist. If there is no God, there's no ultimate meaning or purpose to this life. But I want to declare to you today that God was there in the beginning. And everything he created, he created with meaning and, and with purpose. Now, there, there's some who refuse to say, in the beginning, God. They, they've eliminated God completely from the beginning. They'll say, in the beginning, there was space, right? In the beginning, there were these gases, and there were all these, these particles floating around, and those particles collided. Listen, the psalmist writes that it is a fool who says in his heart, there is no God. Be, because the moment you eliminate God from creation, you have a very real problem. Well, you've got a lot of problems. <laughs> but the first one is this. Where did the space come from? Where did, where did all those gases come from? Where, where did all those particles come from? And you can go back and you can add millions and millions of years, but that doesn't answer the question, right? That's the magic wand of evolution. Just add millions of years and, and, and billions of years. But, but here's what I find. When I leave things alone, they don't get better, right? When I leave the yard alone, it doesn't look better two weeks later, right? Things tend to decay, right? And, and so the real question is what caused there to be anything at all in the first place? Why not nothing? See, science can in no way explain why something rather than nothing exists. Only a creator of that something can explain why there is something rather than nothing. If we want to look at things rationally, a creator is the only, I would say, logical explanation for existence. And if only one thing can explain something, it's likely that one thing is the explanation. I mean, think about it. What are the other alternatives, right? I call them really bad alternatives, that creation created itself, and, and it created itself from nothing. Or you could say, well, creation has always existed, but both of those are less rational than the argument for a creator. In order to be an atheist, you have to believe that the universe came about by itself. You have to believe that life came from non-life by itself. You have to believe that consciousness came about by itself, and to be perfectly honest with you, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. If I look at things rationally, I understand an argument for a God who created the world is far more intellectually compelling than atheism. In order for there to be anything, there must first be an uncaused cause of all things. My father used to say it this way, God is the uncaused cause of all causes. Write it down, think about it later, right? Uncaused cause of all causes. It's, it's very interesting that Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 is silent in regards to God's origins. That's because everything, with the exception of God, has a beginning. One of my sister's little boys asked me a question one time. He said, Uncle Dan, who made the world? I said, God did. And he followed up and he said, Well, who created God? I said, No one. And he wasn't too happy with that answer. But if God were created, God would not be God. If, if God had a creator, that creator would be God. If God had a father, his father would be God. And then, of course, someone would come along and say, well, who created God's father, right? You could go on forever, right? But the book of Genesis speaks nothing of God's origin. Why? Because he has no origin. He has no beginning. Prior to God creating, there was nothing. There was only God. Thanks to the mind of Einstein, we know that even time had a beginning, meaning God also created time. And because he created time, it means he pre-existed time and therefore he lives outside of time. In the beginning, God. Now, why have people sought to eliminate God from the beginning? Well, if you remember, Romans chapter 1 told us that they don't wish to retain God in their minds. They, they, they don't want God to be a part of their thinking because as soon as you acknowledge that there is a God, as soon as you look around and you say, you know what, he's probably responsible for all of this. That means that I live in his world. What does that mean? That I'm accountable to him. And so if you want to do your own thing and you want to live by your own rules, it's much more convenient to say in the beginning gases were floating around and there was this big bang and all this just kind of happened instead of saying in the beginning God. But can I just say those four words are really the doorway to Scripture. You can't go to any part of the Bible unless you first go through Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I'll say it again. I said it last week. If you can believe that, then nothing else in Scripture will be difficult to believe. 
Like people wrestle with things in the Bible all the time. They're like, really, pastor, how, how on earth did Jonah survive in the belly of a whale? Like, it doesn't even seem possible, right? Or, or uh, how did the, the Red Sea split in two? Or that story about an ax head floating, that, that's not possible, right? How did Jesus walk on the water or rise from the dead? Listen, compared to what we read in Genesis chapter one, verse one, everything else is easy to believe. And so again, this is the doorway to scripture. And here's why. If there's a creator, then it will make rational sense as we go through scripture that this creator would care about his creation. And if God created beings that care about good and evil, he must also care about good and evil. Listen, it does not seem very likely to me that caring beings were created by an uncaring God. And so as we go through scripture from Genesis on, you will see it makes a very compelling case for the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Back in 1903, Uh, a scientist by the name of Herbert Spencer said that everything we know can be divided into one of five categories. It'll fall into one of of five categories. He said those categories are time, force, action, space, and matter. And listen, as brilliant as Herbert Spencer thought he was, we already had those five categories given to us in the very first verse of scripture, in the beginning, time. God, he's the force, created, there's the action, the heavens, space, and the earth matter. All five categories are spoken of in the very first verse of the Bible. Now, this word create is the Hebrew word barah, and and it means to bring something into existence, and it really talks about making something from nothing. Time, space, and matter all came into existence at the same time. Barah, that word is only used in scripture for the action of God. You and I, we cannot barah, okay? Whatever we create, we need to start with some raw materials, right? And my wife is bugging me to build a chicken coop. Uh, I'm gonna do that. But in order to build a chicken coop, I need to go to Home Depot. I need to get some supplies, right? I can't just speak that thing into existence. But God is, is the only one who can create something from nothing. And so he creates the earth, and, and there in verse two, it, it tells us that the earth was without form, it was void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So the original state of the earth was this, tohu and vohu. Tohu means empty or nothingness, tohu wa vohu literally means an empty desert, okay? It's another word for a barren desert. And darkness was over the face of the deep. It is believed that the early earth was covered completely with water. Even in the scientific community, there was this thought that the earth at its origin was covered in a global ocean. It had no mountains. This is the face of the deep that's described here. But how did the writer of Genesis, think about this, know more than 3,400 years ago that the earth at its creation was submerged in darkness and in water? And so we have matter. And that matter is covered in water and the Spirit of God is hovering over the water. The the term used here is the same term used of a bird hovering over her nest in Isaiah 31.5. This is the very first reference to the Spirit of God, and the Spirit is hovering over the chaos of this matter in total darkness. Can I just say this morning, many things begin in chaos, don't they? Many of our lives, if we're honest, they, they begin in chaos. But when the Spirit of God begins to hover over things, there is always a change. Things go from a state of formlessness and emptiness to a state of order and purpose. And and what we see here in Genesis is that God's work is not only creating and making, but it's about bringing order out of chaos. Genesis chapter 1 is about divine order. The whole book of Genesis, there's a divine order. This order, these distinctions are are, are fundamental, they're necessary. God is the creator of order and distinctions. The Antichrist is the opposite. He's all about lawlessness and chaos. Understand, the enemy of our souls will always try to do away with the distinctions that God has made. We're going to see it right away in chapter 3 when Satan tells Adam and Eve that if they eat of the fruit, you can be like God. There's no distinction there. They try to remove a distinction that God made. Here in Genesis, God's going to distinguish between a few things. Write some of these down. He's going to distinguish between light and dark, right? Between day and night. There's a clear distinction between land and water, between humans and, and animals. God distinguishes between man and God, between good and evil, between man and woman. There's a distinction between the the holy and the profane, between parent and child. Again, these are all things that our society is trying to do away with these distinctions right now. 
There's a distinction between that which is beautiful and that which is ugly. There's a very clear distinction between life and death. And, and as we go through the book of Genesis, okay, we're going to talk a lot about these distinctions because one of our primary tasks as the people of God is to preserve God's order and his distinctions. And the battle that we're facing right now as Western society abandons the Bible, as they abandon the God of the Bible, is that society wants to abandon these distinctions. And, and really what we're facing, some call it a culture war. I don't think it's a culture war. It's not a war of two cultures. It's a war between culture and chaos. It's a war between biblical distinctions and a human desire to undo all of those distinctions. But the future of our nation depends on our ability as the people of God to hold up those distinctions and say, you know what, these are important. It was G.K. Chesterton that said this, every high civilization decays by forgetting obvious things. So some of these distinctions we're gonna talk about over these next few months, you would say, you know what, 20 years ago this was obvious, but in America that's not the case. As crazy as it sounds, 20 years ago, we knew what a woman was. Imagine that, right? But hear me, the United States will continue to decay if we continue to forget obvious things. Verse three, here's the first change. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. I don't believe this is speaking of the creation of the sun because the sun's gonna come later on, right? This is the creation of, of the photons. This is the creation of, of wave particles. All of a sudden, there is illumination. And yet we know this, that God does not need light to see. He, he's a spirit. He's aware of all things. In verse three, this is not God making what he needs, but he's making what we need. After space and matter come light. Today we understand scientifically, right, the necessity of light. It's, it's light that actually fuels everything. Light provides the power that we need as living creatures in one way or another. Light is the third ingredient needed for physical life, and that is the direction that God's moving here in verse three. But I want you to notice something else in, in just these first three verses. Verse one, we have God the Father. He, he's almighty, he's the eternal one. Verse two, we have the Spirit of God, right? We refer to him as the Holy Spirit. In verse three, we have the Word of God. God said, the Apostle John tells us that Jesus is the Word of God in human form. And so right here in the first three verses of Genesis, verse one, two, and three, we have the Father, we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Son. The Father is the creator, the Spirit brings order from chaos, and the Son is the Word of God. He's, he's the instrument of creation but we have all three and all three are one. The apostle John is gonna tell us in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. God is the creator and Jesus the, is the word, the, the instrument of that creation. We, we don't have to go very far in scripture to find Jesus right here in the third verse of Genesis chapter one. John chapter nine, verse five, Jesus declares that he is the light of the world. And I want to make it very clear, when God created light, he did not create Jesus. Jesus was always a part of the Godhead. When, when Jesus said that, he wasn't saying, I'm photons or I'm, I'm light rays. What he was really saying is, I am to you what light is to the world. If you think about all that light does, it, it warms our planet, it, it illuminates things, it makes it possible for, for us to live. Without light, you and I could not see, right? Without light, we would stumble around. And Jesus says, if you don't wanna stumble around in life, you need to come to him for his light. The psalmist said in Psalm 119 that the word, the word of God is, is, is a light to our path. We need Jesus, hear me? We need Jesus in order to be able to see spiritually. It's only his light that can illuminate the darkness of our world. Verse four, here's the first distinction. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God is good, and, and everything he does is good. Think about how good light is, right? When, when there's less light in the wintertime, how do you get depressed a little bit, right? Like you leave for work, it's dark out, you get home, it's dark, right? You're like, I just need some sunshine. And, and what's the first thing you do if you, if you get away from New York in the wintertime, you end up on a beach, you're just like, ah. Oh. All right. Soak it up. Light is good. We, we, we need it, right? And there's this distinction here. But I want to say this. We ought to be grateful for the light that God brings in our lives. Now, again, remember, the sun's not created yet, but the space goes from darkness. All of a sudden, there's light. God makes a separation of light and darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. The first day of creation is completed. 
Again, there's no sun yet. I can't tell you if it was a 24-hour period, but look at what Scripture says. There was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, I read that and I say, man, he got it backwards. It's not evening. It's morning and evening, right? No, not in the mind of the Hebrew people. For the Jews, a new day always begins in the evening. It's why Shabbat, the, the Sabbath, begins for our neighbors when the sun goes down on Friday night. As soon as they can see the first three stars in the sky, Sabbath begins. And I love that. Because if a new day begins when the sun goes down, then what's the very first thing you do? You go to sleep, you rest, right? When we think of a day, we think, man, here's all the things that I got to get done before I get to rest today, right? But for the Hebrew mind, the day begins with rest. We ought to operate out of this place of rest. We don't work to rest. We rest in order to work. That's the first five verses. Look at that. First five verses of Genesis chapter one. And I think you know we're going to be here for a while, okay? But what important verses these five are. They they tell us that creation began with space and matter and light. Practically speaking, can I just say that makes a whole lot of sense. It it doesn't sound like a myth, and yet this story predates most myths. Again, it was recorded by Moses about 3,500 years ago. And and Genesis, what we're going to see as we walk through it, it, is so full of spiritual symbolism, and yet it's very practical in regards to what we see. We see a God who is the creator of all things. Again, he's the uncaused cause of all causes. He is our creator. He's your creator. And what that means is that he cares about his creation. He cares about you. He's good. And and everything he does is good. You you can know that today. All throughout Genesis, we're going to see these distinctions. Again, these distinctions that are made. And, And the apostle Paul draws on one of those distinctions when he's writing to the church in Ephesus. He's speaking to the believers there. Here's what he writes. He says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He doesn't say at one time you were in darkness. He says at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And now he calls us to be his light. Paul's drawing on Genesis chapter 1 to tell us a spiritual reality, and it's this. We can either live in darkness or we can live in light. And maybe you're here today and your life feels a little bit more like verse 2, right? You say, I get it, without form. I feel like, Pastor, honestly, I'm without purpose. There's this void. There's, There's something that's lacking. At the same time, I believe this today, that if you're here in the room, you're here for a reason. And I believe that the Spirit of God is in this place. And for some of you, even right now, the Spirit of God is is hovering over your life. And I want to encourage you, just submit to him. Surrender to his plan for your life. He desires to bring order out of chaos. Remember, our our God is a creator, meaning he can bring something from nothing. Maybe you're here today and you say, I don't even know if he's got a lot to work with. That's okay. He can make something from nothing. All he needs is a heart that is willing If you feel like you're walking in darkness today, I want to encourage you, invite the light of Christ into your darkness. Hear Jesus' words, John chapter 3, verse 21. But whoever lives by the truth, it's important that we know the truth, we live by the truth. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. We're called, church, to live by the truth. And when we do that, we come into the light. I'm praying that as we walk through Genesis together as a church, that God would open up our eyes. You talk about this theme of of light. You can see it all throughout Scripture. It begins in Genesis chapter 1 at the beginning of time, and it actually culminates in a beautiful picture at the end of time. You can go from the first chapter of Scripture to the last chapter, Revelation 22.5, and there's this picture of what is to come. There's this picture of what's ahead of all those who walk in the light. This is a culmination of chapter 1 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 gives us the beginning of light. Revelation chapter 22 gives us the end of darkness. Revelation 22, 5 says, There will be no more night. There will not be need, we, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Again, at the beginning, there was light. The sun's not created, so it is the light of God. It's the light of God that's illuminating everything. But there's coming a day that we're not going to need the sun anymore because we're going to be in the presence of God. There's coming a day when his, his light is going to shine completely into our lives. 
But I want to encourage you, don't wait for that day. Don't wait for that day when you can live in that light right now. As we close, maybe that needs to be your prayer. Again, if you're walking in a place where, man, it's darkness, I'm trying to figure out my way, uh, allow the light of Christ to shine into your life. Maybe that needs to be your prayer even now. Lord, light my life. <laughs> light my path. Give me direction. Ask the light of the world to reveal himself to you and respond to his leading. Would you stand with me? I'm praying, again, as we walk through this book together that God will reveal so many things to you. But I would say this, the the first thing he needs is a willing heart. If that's your desire to know him in greater ways, as we close, just ask him. Say, God, as we go on this journey, would you reveal yourself to me in, in greater ways? Let that be your prayer as we close today.